We are continuing from where we left off. We ended the last session at chapter 1, verse 30. And to quickly summarize, we left off at that point where Arjun was experiencing a great deal of turmoil and he was losing his courage. We spoke about the fact that when we reach a certain point in yoga meditation, when we get certain glimpses about ourselves, when we get to know ourselves through practice of yoga meditation, we also see our negative qualities. And when we see our negative qualities, we experience what can be called in modern terms stress. In popular belief, one says yoga makes you healthy, yoga makes you peaceful, yoga makes you content, and these are mentioned as reasons for practicing yoga. Surely these are reasons for practicing yoga if you are practicing only a form of yoga that is physical with perhaps a bit of pranayam. But yoga meditation is quite different. In yoga meditation, we may experience initially a feeling of well-being as you learn the practices, as you learn a bit of asana and pranayam, as you sit down and you learn to sit regularly, you learn to discipline yourself. But as you start getting to deeper layers of the mind, you come up with a layer where you see negative traits in you. And when you see these, it is unpleasant. It's not very nice. And for a meditator, the first glimpse can be very, very frightening, can be a shock. And if that meditator does not have a good guide, a good teacher, a good mentor, he may give up meditation altogether. So that's where we left Arjun. We left Arjun at a place where he was terribly unhappy, he was despondent, he was depressed, he was quite ready to give up the battle of life. And so I will continue to read from verse 31. And I see inauspicious omens, O Krishna, nor do I see any good occurring upon killing... Radhika? Yes, uh, uh, Aranga? I don't know if I'm the only one, but I don't see anything. Ah, <laughs> thank you, Aranga. Oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you for reminding thank me. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and I see inauspicious omens, O Krishna, nor do I see any good occurring upon killing my own kinsmen in the battle. I do not desire victory, O Krishna, nor kingdom, nor comforts. What use do we have for kingdom, Lord of the senses? And what to us is enjoyment of pleasures or even life itself? They, for whose sake we might decide... Sorry, there was somebody saying something? Okay, that was probably just a... Mm. They, for who, whose sake we might desire a kingdom, pleasures and comforts, are standing here before us on the battlefield, having abandoned their very lives and wealth. Teachers, father-like elders, Sons as well as grandfathers, uncles, fathers-in-law, grandsons, brothers-in-law, and other relatives. I do not wish to kill them, even if they are killing me, O destroyer of illusion, not even for the sake of the kingdom 
of the three worlds. How then could I do so merely for the sake of this earth? What pleasure can we derive by killing the sons of Dhritarashtra, O faultless one? Only sin can accrue to us by killing these phalons. Therefore, it does not behoove us to kill the sons of Dhritarashtra, our kinsmen. How can we be happy after killing our very own relatives, O Krishna? Though the Kauravas' minds are impaired by greed and so are not seeing the fault accrues by the destruction of the, of the family and the sin in the desire to injure friends, how then should we not know enough to turn away from this sin as we are able to see the fault that accrues upon the destruction of the family, O Krishna? So we have verses 31 to 39 where Arjun elaborates on the reasons why he wants to give up even before the battle has started. For many of us who come to yoga, we come because we have experienced certain ups and downs in life. We have seen certain things in our life, have, have had many experiences, and many of the experiences have been bitter, have been unpleasant. We have suffered. And therefore, in search of a solution to this, we have been seeking something that will help us, release us from this bondage of suffering. Nobody wants to suffer. But how do we get out of this suffering? And in search for these ideas, many have come to yoga. Very often the initial immediate idea when one thinks of yoga is peace. We all love each other, we think of harmony, we think of peace. Naturally, all of us desire peace. By nature, there are very few people, I believe, by nature, who like strife, who like conflicts. Most of us want to have harmony. So when we come to yoga, our first idea is harmony, peace, love. And looking for these ideas, we forget that if there are conflicts, and there are situations where there are conflicts, we cannot ignore them. However, when we come to yoga, we start meditating, our first innate understanding or innate desire is to have peace. And because of this, a natural habit that we have learned through our upbringing is to avoid conflicts, avoid fights. And what happens when we see the negative qualities in ourselves? We don't want to look at them. We avoid them. Another word for that is suppression or repression. We don't want to look at these things. When that happens, the conflict has not gone away. If you have two aspects in you, one perhaps is more upright and the other perhaps a little bit more egoistical, materialistic by nature. And these two are in conflict. We may not want to look at that conflict. However, we cannot have real, lasting, sustainable peace without resolving conflicts. I recall the words of Martin Luther King Jr. here when he fought for the rights of black people in the United States. A lot of people said, why are you starting these conflicts? Why don't you just let it be? And he said, there cannot be peace without justice. It was the same with Mahatma Gandhi. And a lot of people said, oh, it's fine, let the British rule the country. They're doing anyway such a good job. It's no problem. 
And he said, no, we, we are slaves. That cannot be. There's a lot of injustice. We need to fight this. We cannot pretend that this is peace. This is not peace. This is a truce. Or this is a ceasefire, you can call it. But this is not real, sustainable peace, as long as there's injustice. So the same applies to, for our minds. What applies to society also applies for our minds. When we have internal conflicts, and these are not resolved, these issues will come back again and again, disturbing the mind, disturbing us. Uh, yes. If I can ask something. Sure. Uh, in the context of Mahabharata, Panduvas did a lot of effort to have some peace yes. at first. Yes. So they were even willing to take one village yes. um, instead of a kingdom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so they wouldn't have fought if they had got that one village. Yes. So what is so how how is that kind of approach? Uh, how does that translate into inner life, into yoga? that they were willing to accommodate. Yeah. If we understand the situation as Buddhi is trying to talk to the mind, have a dialogue, and if we have negative traits, for example, we have materialistic traits, and the, the senses keep going outwards towards material objects, strengthening desires rather than um, attenuating desires. And Buddhi would have a dialogue and try to convince the mind, mind, it is not useful to have such materialistic tendencies. Ten, turn, turn inwards, the real joy is inwards. But what happens there is that because the mind and the senses have not been trained, the mind continues to go outward. So dialogue, the peaceful negotiations fail. And that's exactly what happened with Krishna, who attempted, as you are well aware, he was the one who uh, attempted the peace talks between the Pandavas and the Mahava, in the Mahabharat, between the Pandavas and the uh, Kauravas, and the peace talks failed because the Kauravas would refuse to give even one I think one inch of land it was, uh, Duryodhan said. I and, think a pinpoint, yeah. Yes. So with that kind of stand uh, of negativity, we see that certain negative traits in us, in ourselves, have to be uprooted. We cannot merely attenuate them because these are the very roots and from these roots come more negative traits. So our vidya flourishes. So it keeps on growing if you don't pull it out of the very roots. So initially one tries peaceful negotiation in the context of the mind. It means we learn to train our manas, we learn to train ahankara. But all this training leads us finally to the conclusion that the roots of certain negative traits have to be removed from the very root. You can attenuate and you can manage. You can be a little bit healthier, you can be a little bit happier, you can be better at just in society. And these things definitely uh, happen, are very positive developments when one starts practicing yoga. As one advances further in meditation, one comes to a point where you understand that for further development, we have to get rid of these negative traits from the very root. The klesha itself, the seed, has to be burnt. Attenuating is not enough. This brings us to the Yoga Sutras. The klesha, as you know, they can be attenuated, the coloring of the samskaras can decrease. And finally, these are burned in the fire of knowledge when the kundalini rises. So you can say that this battle is really a 
graphic or pictorial representation of Kundalini. It is burning up of the samskaras in the last battle and killing or destroying these seeds at the very root, burning each of them up so that they do not grow ever again. Moksha. So in the context of Mahabharata, the battle was inevitable in a sense that it had to happen at some point. It has to happen at some point. It's a question whether you're going to go in for this battle in this lifetime or maybe many lifetimes down the line. Yeah. I have mentioned before that spiritual evolution will take place irrespective of what you do. That is how nature is. So we are evolving continuously. It is only a matter of speed. When you start yoga meditation, you speeden up that process. So Arjun is so when, here. So, okay, sorry, somebody wanted to say. So when do we then declare the <laughs> internal war? You know, the peace talks in our dialogue stop, and we say that's enough. <laughs> now, now the big weapons come out, and how do they look? You, you, you will come to a point in when, in your own life when you will say, no, this is not enough. I'm still suffering. It's good, it's good, my little practices and all have helped me, things have not got worse. But it's not enough. I want to go for the big thing, the final thing. When you become a yogi whose eyeball is so sensitive, you know, everybody has a very sensitive eyeball, even if a fine little lash, eyelash, you know, the finest little eyelash falls on the eyeball, it bothers us so much we do not rest until we have removed that little eyelash. A little bit of dust, a speck of dust goes into your eyes and it disturbs so much that you know you cannot rest until it is out. So they say in the Yoga Sutras, the mind of the yogi is so sensitive, is as sensitive as the eyeball. And Sutra 2.15 says, the yogi sees everything in the world as pain. When your normal life, which may be wonderful from a certain perspective, from a materialistic perspective, you may find that you are a wealthy prince, Arjun, or you are a wealthy prince like Buddha was, like Mahavir, this, the 24th saint of the giants. These were all princes. The legendary king Janak, he was a king. Ram, he was a great prince. None of them uh, were wanting in anything. Krishna was a prince, king of Dwarka. They had everything in material sense. They were wealthy, they had beautiful uh, uh, wives, they had uh, wealth, they had kingdoms, they had health, they were young, they were beautiful, handsome, uh, skillful in battle, strong. What did they need? Nothing. Yet, there was something which knew this is not enough. I have to get to the foundation. I have to get to that part which is permanent. When that longing is so deep inside you for that which is permanent, for that which is eternal, and that longing grows so strong that you cannot rest without it, then you will declare war against those uh, deep uh, samskaras, against all these glaciers. And um, so that is a very personal uh, internal decision-making process, a very personal um, path for every person. It's different for every person. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. So, Arjun is is not at the point yet where he's declared war because, in fact, he's quite um, wanting to get out of the war because he has seen. 
something in himself there which he doesn't like. He, isn't, he doesn't have the strength to fight against all these great ideas. I'm sure all of you have experienced this, where you are in some amazingly well-paid jobs, or you have attained some status symbols or something, and you go on the path of yoga and people are telling you, why are you doing this? Why, why are you doing all this yoga stuff? This is for old people. This is for people who want to run away from life. Why are you giving up this great job and, and doing this yoga stuff? You should go earn more money. Why do you want to lead a simple life? Right? I'm sure that many of us know this. And what is that? That is a part of us which is pulling us outwards. And these kind of ideas, these are holy ideas, you know, make lots of money, be rich, get a name, become famous, be successful. These are ideas these are those hundred sons of Dhritarashtra, Avidya, that keeps multiplying. And it's very hard to fight against these. All of us have gone through the process where maybe you were surrounded by people who wanted to be successful in life. And they say, what is all this about values? Why are you talking about values and being a good person and helping others? Just go sell, buy yourself an, uh, you know, another house or another car. C uh, gather more money, earn more. And these are the conflicts that we are facing. And these, this is the internal battle that we are facing all the time. And this is, these are exactly the conflicts that we need to resolve. And here Arjun is standing in front of these great warriors and he is beginning to get shaky. He's beginning to wonder, am I actually on the right path? Is this the right thing? And I'm sure all of you have asked yourselves this question. Am I doing the right thing by maybe taking a job that gives me more time? Maybe I earn less, but I have more time for my practice. I have more time to, de to devote to my family, to my own development. And you begin to doubt yourself. And where do these doubts come from? These are the conflicts from our upbringing. This is the internal battle that we're facing all the time. And Arjun is beginning to question whether he is on the right path. When we start questioning ourselves, we must remember that there is an aspect of escapism as well. We cannot escape this life here, this worldly life. As long as you have a body, you have to live in this world and you have to go through certain duties that you need to perform. So when you say, I want to progress on the path, you need to be very aware. Is this escapism or is this really determination? Sankalp Shakti, which is taking you further. There is a certain danger here that certain people who are not able to cope with life, they can convince themselves, just like Arjun here is convincing himself with very logical discussions and arguments. Like he says, how can I fight against my grandsire, against my uncles, my, my, my own relatives, my friends. How can I kill these people? I will, be, I will, I will only get, uh, you know, bad samskaras. This is sinful, this kind of action. So he uses very logical arguments to convince himself that what he is doing, giving up this battle, is right. And so also, we are doing this all the time. We are having this conscious and most often unconscious level of dialogue where we are trying to convince ourselves, hey, it's okay, you know, this is, I don't need to fight. I just, I just go along with the things the way they are. We give up this internal battle because we are not strong enough yet. 
So we need to develop that sankarp shakti, that determination, that strength. For that, we need more and more of these direct experiences. At that time, it is really, really useful to have a teacher, to have a mentor, to have a guide or counsel like Krishna who would motivate you and say, don't give up. Now is not the time to give up. Now is the time to be strong. The mind is very, very tricky. So, Ahankara can pose as Buddhi. Ahankara can pose as that inner voice of wisdom and say, don't do this sinful act, don't kill people and convince you that this is not the right action. Similarly, your internal mind, your internal voice of wisdom can tell you, just don't create any trouble, do your job, just be a well-adjusted person, go with the society. And of course, we all know, all of us who are here in this meeting, that modern society is extremely materialistic and we are here because we have realized that we want to have deeper values. And There seems to be some disturbance. I don't know if somebody is trying to say something and it's not working. Is this the Android attendee, whoever that may be? Can I request you to mute yourself? I had muted you earlier. I will mute you again. If you have something to share to st or a question to ask, maybe you can use the chat instead. Okay, so this was Arjun's despondency. He gets depressed. He wants to give up on this battle of life. Those who want to give up on the battle of life, they always find excuses and extremely good convincing arguments. And that's where you need a very sharp buddhi. And if you don't have a very sharp buddhi as yet, you need to have a very good guide or mentor. Arjun was fortunate that he had Krishna who was guiding him. So we continue with verses 40 to 45. Upon the disappearance of family traditions, and rules of conduct, vice and unrighteousness subdue the entire family. When subdued by vice, O Krishna, the women of the family become corrupted. When the women are corrupted, O ruler of your clan, there occurs confusion of the social structure. Such confusion leads only to hell for the whole family, including those who have destroyed the family. Even the ancestors fall into hell, since the rites and observances for preventing them from doing so are no longer performed. Because of these faults of the destroyers of the family, which cause the confusion of the social structure, the perennial national traditions as well as family traditions are uprooted. When the family traditions of human beings are thus uprooted, O Krishna, these human beings have to dwell in hell indefinitely. So have we heard in the tradition. O oh, alas, we are embarking upon committing a great sin as we are preparing to kill our own kinsmen out of greed for kingdom and comfort. So you see, Arjun has a, a lot of extremely good arguments uh, that he is using to convince himself that he should not fight. And they are so logical and so well put that it is very difficult to, to have a counter-argument. 
Yet at the same time, there are certain points that he mentions that are very interesting and that we should go into because they tell us about our society in general. We must remember that the Bhagavad Gita, the Mahabharata, these scriptures were written thousands of years ago. Estimated age of these could be from 6,000 to 4,000 years um, ago, which means um, the human population at that time was very, very low. In those days, there were severe droughts, famines, and natural disasters of any kind could wipe out the entire population of the earth, I mean the human population of the earth, because the population was very little, the human population, I mean. Today, the population of the planet, the human population is around 7 billion. So unless there is a world catastrophe like an asteroid hitting the planet, it's highly unlikely that humankind will be totally destroyed. But in those days, it was very, very possible. It was a reality that humankind could be destroyed. Therefore, there was a great deal of emphasis on tradition, on handing down knowledge. That is where the Brahmin tradition of handing down knowledge came from. It was a very fine and sophisticated system of transfer of knowledge, which took place from father to son. However, there is another lineage which is not perhaps given that much importance, even though it is far more important than the, the, the Brahmin lineage, and that is the lineage from mother to daughter. The women of the family, they are holding, they are custodians of social values and a knowledge of life that is very important for the development of humankind. The woman is Why a sense. So, excuse me, I just have a question. Why is it then actually that now we're talking about the women? I just realized that, for example, the sons of Pandu, they are all male. Yes. And they're mostly male. So is there any significance in this? Um, because they are supposed to represent our inner dwelling and I'm sure this is also meant to be female and, and male, so where is some female aspect? Here? Well, here Arjun is giving arguments why he should not be fighting the battle and in that he talks about society. The uh, analogy or the metaphor of fighting the battle of uh, the internal battle is um, a metaphor that we should not stretch uh, uh, too much because the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita and the entire Mahabharat are teachings at various layers and levels. Our minds are the way they are because we are continuously dealing with society outside. The study of the yoga is not merely the study of the mind because the mind is a manifest, sorry, society is a manifestation of the mind. Society is reflecting the mind. And so these two are very closely connected. We are talking about women because women hold the key to social development. Women are the center of the household, the family. And family is the smallest unit of society. Our tradition is tradition of the Divine Mother. Those of us who may see Divine Mother as a goddess may uh, be doing injustice to this idea because it is much, much more than that. The tradition of the Divine Mother is basically a Shakta tradition, which means that in this tradition we learn how Shakti works. Shakti is 
another word for Maya. When the world is an obstacle for us because we are not able to cope with it, we don't know how to live in the world, then it is Maya. It is a veil of ignorance. But when we learn how to deal with it, it is no longer a veil of ignorance. It becomes pure consciousness and we learn how to live in the world and above it. And this is then Shakti. And women represent Shakti because without women, there would be no children. Women bear children and the family system has, you can say, been created by the fact that women need to raise their children. If society would have been left to men, we would probably still be living in caves. But because women bore children and needed to raise the children and continue the human race, it became necessary to develop many institutions, like the institution of marriage, like the institution of family. And all of these are traditions which are handed down. There is another important tradition or lineage and that is the yogic lineage. So these lineages are very important. They have a meaning. They bring continuity into our lives. So the yoga lineage hands down the teachings in the pure form. When the lineage breaks, the teachings are lost. That would be a disaster for future seekers if there would be no more lineages. What would happen? People would read books and make up their own version of yoga, which is already happening. I know that. I'm well aware of it. But that is why the lineage or the oral tradition is so important. We cannot learn much out of books websites and videos. We need to have a guide, a teacher, who has had a direct experience of this and who can explain this to you. When you read these scriptures without background, without direct experience, you are very likely to misinterpret them and misunderstand them, even abuse them. What happens then is that if your mind is ignorant, is covered by the veil of Maya, you will only understand that which you are capable of understanding. Everything will go through the filter of impure senses. You will not understand it the way it is meant to be understood. That can be explained to you only by somebody, by a teacher who has got direct experience and who has got access to the internal teacher, to the guru within. As long as you do not have access to the guru within you, you need such a lineage. So you see this here he's arguing in terms of lineages. He wants to preserve the lineage of the Brahmins or the society which is handing down knowledge for the welfare of society, the lineage of, of the family structure. And of course, in those days, since famine, drought, all these things could wipe out entire human populations, it was important for humankind to take care of these family structures and these traditions. And so it was said that if you did not continue the lineage, or the tradition, it would be a great sin. What does sin mean? Sin is samskaras, not very nice samskaras. Samskaras that do not help further in your development is being translated as sin here. If I would have translated it, I would have probably looked for another word. The word sin is so loaded uh, with such a, a guilt and um, that's not uh, the case actually with the word samskara. Can I, can I ask you to clarify something? Yes, please go ahead. 
and um. it, um, there seems to be an echo there seems to be a problem with you know that's because um, we have a slight technical issue I think is because we have so many people trying to join in and we have asked um, for the go to meeting platform for to increase the capacity to to more since uh, more people are showing interest in in the Bhagavad Gita sessions but that I think will happen only from next Friday onwards so there may be a slight echo but Scott you can go ahead and ask the question anyway okay a minute ago you, you mentioned about um, when we see uh, uh, Shakti as, as the goddess you, you mean externally right I mean because we see the goddess within I mean even as a male I mean the goddess within are archetypes or characteristics of, uh, the, of uh, that we need actually in order to progress spiritually so did you mean like like just worshiping an external goddess I was yes referring to people who consider the tradition of the divine mother as being the worship of an external goddess uh, okay. in that context okay. yes but of course um, as I explained there are many layers of understanding uh, the goddess and at the most external level, one can have a goddess and they, can, they may be worshipped. And our tradition, we do not condemn this practice. It may be useful, it may be comforting to certain people. In our tradition, we lead the student towards the internal, more subtle levels of worship and eventually to the direct experience of Shakti itself the direct experience or attainment of pure consciousness. And this, these layers, the understanding of these layers comes with practice and with over a period of time, with maturity and practice. Okay, so we can continue to the next so Arjun has been putting forward some very good arguments of why he should not fight this battle and he has finished his arguments more or less so he says Arjun says if the sons of Dhritarashtra with weapons in hand kill me in the battle while I am unarmed and unavenging that will be more beneficial to me. Sanjaya said, having spoken thus in the middle of the battle, Arjun sat down on the seat of the chariot, putting away the bow together with the arrows, his mind agitated with grief. So, now we see the setting is that Arjun has given many arguments why he should not fight the battle, and uh, he, he says he will not fight and if the sons of Dhritarashtra, the Kauravas, kill him, he said that <clears throat> will be a better death than to, to, to murder or kill his relatives. He sat down in the middle of the battle. There is a slight mistake here. He sat down in the middle of the battlefield. The battle has not started yet. He is, both the armies are on two sides and Arjun and Krishna <clears throat> are in the middle of the battlefield. So sitting there in the middle of the battlefield, he puts away his bow and his arrow and he is extremely agitated. This is the argumentation of a lot of people, as I mentioned, who come to yoga. They adopt a passive approach. Yoga is not about passivity. One of the persons who was greatly inspired by the Bhagavad Gita was Mahatma Gandhi. He fought an entire empire. He fought the British Empire on the basis of this idea, non-violence. But did that mean that he was a coward? Did that mean he was not fighting? He did not use violent means, but he did fight. 
for those of you who know a little bit about the freedom struggle in India against the British Empire, it was one of the most amazing turning points in world history because it showed how human beings can fight very, very powerful um, forces and authorities if they come together. That freedom struggle inspired many, many other great struggles like Martin Luther King Jr. in the struggle uh, for the rights of black people in the United States and the uh, struggle um, with Nelson Mandela at the head against apartheid in South Africa, just to mention a few. This was inspired by the Bhagavad Gita, this idea of non-violence. Why? Because Mahatma Gandhi read this and he said, this is not passivity that Arjun is talking about here. It is fighting. We, Mahatma Gandhi fought the battle against the British, but non-violence. He stood against the British guns, British cannons, British lattes, the sticks, you know. They were beaten up with big sticks and uh, lots of people lost their lives in that freedom struggle. They called it non-cooperation. Well, all these ideas were inspired by the Bhagavad Gita because the Bhagavad Gita represents that fight in the in internal struggles, the internal battle, the fight for values, upholding dharma, both of these whether internal or external, through non-violent methods. You cannot succeed in the internal struggle with self-violence. If you learn the key to meditation, you will find out that the key is self-acceptance, non-violence, ahimsa, the first yama. And this may sound confusing because the, the setting, the battlefield brings a lot of people to the idea that the Bhagavad Gita is not only condoning violence but encouraging violence. It is not. It is a symbol and it needs to be understood in that context. But it is definitely not encouraging passivity. It is not encouraging a fatalistic approach to life. Quite on the contrary, it is for people who take their lives into their own hands. So when Arjun sits down, puts away his bow, he is symbolic of that meditator who is so overwhelmed by his own inner conflicts that he feels, oh, I cannot do it. It's too much. It's overwhelming. I will never succeed. And we all know that, that sometimes we feel overwhelmed. We feel we cannot cope. We feel that life is simply too difficult, that the mind becomes weak. But we need to get that energy whether it's external or internal, but that's Sankalp Shakti. We cannot lose this battle before it has started. So, here ends the first chapter in which the despondency of Arjun is described. So that was the first chapter and was, in a sense, not even the beginning of the teachings. It was a description of the setting of the battlefield. It's like 
in any story, before one starts the story, one describes the setting, the location, the characters. And now we have a very good picture of the setting. And um, we know that Krishna at this point is there for Arjun. For Arjun who has given up, has been defeated by life itself, is defeated by the struggles and the conflicts that are facing him. And he is depressed, he is despondent and... The next chapter, chapter 2, <clears throat> begins really with the teachings of yoga. Samkhya Yoga is the title in some Sanskrit of this chapter. And we will continue with this chapter next week. <laughs> it's a good place to stop this session since we only have a couple of more minutes to go and um, <laughs> we will begin next week then with the teachings of Krishna. Okay. Aranka? Yes, Aranka? I just want to give you a compliment about the clear uh, explanation of, of um, how how what is the meaning behind all these things because it's really making sense for me thank you so much thank you aranka for the feedback it's really nice to hear that it makes me very very happy to be of some use to be useful yeah it, it is really so clearing up that uh, i mean hmm. Well, I don't know what to say. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're most welcome. It's so nice to hear that. Radhika, I would also like to say thank you for including me in this um, online chat. Oh. Um, I really enjoyed today's session. Nice. And I hope, you know, to continue. Yes, we will, Shanta. For the rest of yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, you're most welcome. Glad you could make it finally. <laughs> yeah, all these attempts. Thank you. So, it was very easy for to follow to this time. Last yeah. time I couldn't. Yes, no. You problem. know, I, I got the link this time. Yeah. Yes, good. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> okay. So good night to Swarnalata, who's uh, burning the midnight lamp there in Malaysia, and. Um, <laughs> Mati ask can't wait for the next chapter. Yes, I can't too. It is very exciting, the second chapter. So, also looking forward to it myself. Thank you everybody for being here. So nice to have you. Yes. Yeah. Most welcome, Michalis. Nice to see you, Hemashri. You're new here. Thank you. Okay, Samia. Okay, yeah, there were problems, Samia, because um, um, we had technical issues because there were so many people trying to join in this time and we have expanded the capacity because of the interest in the Bhagavad Gita. So hopefully by next time you will not have problems connecting. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. Goodbye everybody. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye, Scott. Bye everybody.